looking at it as a beneficial forage legume. And uh, not surprisingly, you would not be surprised to, to learn that I'm going to talk about how can you actually grow it, can you actually grow it, and is there a varietal impact? So we've covered components of that quite a bit from our previous speakers. Um, one of the things that we did uh, at Innovation Farm when we'd been working on this, this crop for many years was to look at uh, what can we do to actually introduce this to farmers that may not have grown it for uh, a generation. And it's interesting to say that about a generation because when I was looking back at uh, Nyab literature um, going back many, many years, we've been going for just under 100 years now, we found literature to show that uh, tenant farmers in the eastern region were uh, actually forced to grow sanfoin at least once in seven years because of that soil improving quality. Uh, we have the alkaline soils in the east of England. Sometimes we're a bit on the heavy side in terms of clay, but as, as Henry said, that doesn't necessarily need to be an impediment. The alkalinity is a key though, and I'd say to anybody here, if your soil type is 6.5 or below, I fear you have a, an absolute non-starter, but anything above that, you definitely are in with a chuck, and if it's 7.5 and it's not too heavy and too waterlogged, then you definitely have potential. So this was a um, packets of seed with this is the actual the cover of the seed that we put on, and, and you can see what we're saying here, pH above 6.5, very drought tolerant, uh, drill late. In the booklet that I think that uh, Cotswell put on your chair, there's, there's, there's considerable details, but I'm going to go about, talk about some of the key ones that we've encountered at NIAB and that uh, we've discussed with the farmers that, that we've uh, encouraged to, to give it a try. Give it a second try. Um, so morphological and agronomic valuation. We did this at the beginning. We looked at about 200 accessions. What's the difference between accession and variety? Uh, Irene flagged this up. So an accession is uh, a genetic line. It probably quite often in, the, in terms of what we were looking at is not a variety as such. A land race, you wouldn't call that a variety, but it's, uh, it's a very good uh, genetic line. And Henry has been uh, growing his land race for many years to very good effect, similarly with the, with the common. But a, an improved variety, as of course the cereal vari uh, growers will know, um, will have a little bit more homogeneity. It'll have been improved to an extent. That word improved, yes, let's, let's play with that a little bit. The difference between an improved uh, sanfoin variety and a land race is quite an interesting one. And I think you could almost summarize it as, do you have a big, heavy crop, as you can see in my picture here, or do you have a, a longevity of crop? And in the past, the farmers used to call it the common variety or the giant variety. I don't think anybody's mentioned that yet, and it is a really key point. <coughs> So um, Pascal was talking about uh, some of her farmers not ma managing to maintain the sward for more than about three to four years. That is pretty much how you would describe a giant type. The giant, it's not a giant, it is bigger. Uh, you get more biomass quicker. You get a slightly more certain um, uh, growth in the first establishment year, but you will lose it after about four years. So, you know, it, it depends what you want. But the common varieties, yes, will get the sort of results that Henry's been talking about, 10 years plus, and it will continue uh, as long as you don't cut it too vigorously too often. So, looking a little bit more at the detail, so this is, uh, this is some work that I did with uh, one of my PhD students right at the beginning. We were looking at what is the difference between all of those accessions that you can collect, and we collected over 230 from... Uh, collections all over the world, and you can see huge difference just manifest in the types, going from these white through the sort of salmon varieties to the much deeper, darker pink. And to return to what Irene was saying about biochemistry, that is, it doesn't really matter whether you've got a different colour of flower. Uh, definitely, if you're a cow, I don't suppose you'd give a damn. However, it is indicative of what's going on in the biochemistry. And so those differences in tannins, they're all part of the same biochemical um, pathways, and they are indicative that you are getting different types of tannins, different quantities of tannins, and uh, in the foliage as well. The slightly thinner, more diffuse leaves, these are the sort that you normally associate with the common types, to the really heavy, meaty, um, many 
lobed leaves that you get with the, uh, with the giant types, and you get a much heavier plant, and I'll come back to that in a minute. We can't see the colours too well in this light. So we actually put a test together to see, you know, what did we have, and, and this is part of the background, and it's, and it's quite useful for, for breeding programmes going forward. I'm not going to spend too much time with it, but things like thickness of stem, well, that's super relevant, because if you're uh, harvesting this and putting it into a haylage, um, if you've got a really thick, brittle stem, then you actually will have problems uh, with that stem snapping and breaking its way through the plastic cover, so it's, it's one to be considered. And again, traditionally, the, some of the, uh, the thinner, lighter stems are more associated with the, the common types, and certainly the Cambridge common, which we did grow in our, our collection, as Henry said, is a little bit taller and a little bit thinner, uh, but lends itself more to that kind of preparation at harvest. The seeds, if you've not actually grown this crop, they're big, they're rather beautiful, actually. Um, they, uh, this, is a, this is actually an Onobricus relative, it's not a sandpoint as such. Um, but they're big, heavy seeds, and there's been quite a bit of work. We haven't talked about it again today, but in the establishment, one of the issues that you do have is uh, actual percentage germination. So Henry said, I don't think they'll germinate. I can, I can absolutely be sure that he's right. If you keep them for too long, the, the percentage germination absolutely shoots down. You really need to keep the seed fresh and stored well. So if you're going to grow it, buy it fresh, plant it. Getting lots of nods from our Cotswold colleagues. I just wanted to touch on this. Nobody's talked about soil microbiology. So one of the things that I've uh, spent many years on working is, uh, is what's going on in the soil environment. And this is one of the things that gives us the benefits in terms of uh, soil quality and, and, and soil delivery in the following crops. So if you put a, uh, some of these uh, leguminous mix, of which sandfoin, of course, is one, uh, one of the things that you get is a colonization by mycorrhizal fungi. And this is one of these associations that ensures uh, delivery of nutrients, very particularly phosphate, back into an available form. And in fact, I was having a very interesting conversation with one of the farmers at the break who was saying, you know, we really have to keep an eye on phosphate uh, and its availability. And um, if you get a good mycorrhizal colonization, as you do do with these uh, forage legumes, you get a much better inoculum potential. So if you've taken out your field and you're an arable farmer, and then you go back into arable after a forage legume, you'll have a much stronger inoculum potential that is delivered by, the, uh, by virtue of the presence of, uh, of these forage legumes. I'm not going to talk about this much because Irene did cover it, but uh, this is another slide from one of our colleagues from uh, Legume Plus and Healthy Hay. This is actually with uh, chestnut extracts, but it's a very similar um, effect. And this, this knackering, <laughs> for want of a better word, of the, uh, of the worm, both its skin and its mouth parts. And, uh, and one of the other things that this means is that when the, the, the nematode worm goes through its complicated life cycle where it exsheaths, it gets rid of the sheath of the... Um, of, on the outside, which enables it to go on to the next stage of its life cycle, it kind of prevents it from doing that. And so it doesn't achieve its full life cycle. So you, you've still got the worm there, but it probably quite often keeps it in a lower stage that is not uh, actually reproductive. And this is quite important because one of the things that vets have realized that if you have a natural anthem melting effect, as you do with these, these uh, tanniniferous forage legumes, you always maintain a low level of worms, and that's really important. If you treat your, your uh, livestock with a, a synthetic anthelmintic, you can purge them completely down to virtually zero, and then that's great for a while, but inevitably they will get reinfected if you've uh, put them back on land that has been used for stock uh, within, the, I don't know how many years, if there's a vet here, you might be able to tell me what the longevity is. They will be reinfected, and then they've lost that, that resistance, that ability to, to deal with the presence of the worms. But if you maintain it at a low level, but a non-sort um, uh, non of reproductive, uh, non-heavy load, then they retain both that ability to deal with it, uh, but at not at a level that's, that's causing them damage. 
So, growing it. Now, this, <laughs> we haven't talked about this, and I'm sad to say, not all farmers have the wonderful experience that Henry has. And I, I've worked with quite a few farmers uh, in the past years in the east of England, so we don't have that beautiful, light, alkaline, sitting on chalk or sitting on limestone sort of uh, soil. But that doesn't mean that you can't grow it. But there are more issues. If you've got a heavier soil, if you've not got the... Um, the rhizobial uh, partners that you need in order to set up the, the, uh, the nitrogen fixing ability of this crop. If you haven't, um, if you haven't got you know, enough porosity and structure in your soil, you are gonna have problems with establishment. And we looked at two ways of improving establishment because if you get a really, really weedy crop in that first year, you know, you're gonna think, do I really want to persist with that and let those seeds go back into my next uh, crop seed bank, possibly not. And I know that a couple of farmers have thought, no, no, that looks too awful. I'm just going to have to give up on it. So we tried two methods, and both of these um, have been successful to an extent. Herbicides, there aren't all that many herbicides, but uh, we've had some success with the trials that we had at NIAB. And companion trial. And traditionally, if you look at all the literature, it says either under sow with spring barley or twine it with, uh, with phleum, with timothy grass, and with festuca, with uh, the fescues of one kind and another. And part of that is to, to deal with the weediness, but actually, part of it also is to deal with the way that the crop grows, matures, and holds itself. So I had a farmer, um, I won't mention his name, he grew an absolutely beautiful crop in the east of England, quite nice uh, soil quality, just the right pH but it got so big and so heavy, he had a, a semi-giant type that it started to fall over and then he completely lost the quality and one year he had to just lose it entirely. So I think the, the questioner who said, how much? I think you have to balance that. I would really not recommend going for a 100% sanfoin in the UK. We've got enough moisture, we've got enough rainfall to give you a decent crop perhaps not so much in some parts of France where you can get away with it. And I know that the Spanish grow it as a single crop, but I wouldn't recommend it in the UK. I would mix it. And then that stiff um, presence of the, of the phlegm or whatever other companion crop you decide upon keeps it upright and then you don't lose your crop. So some of the actual details. Um, you've got more details in your grower's guide, by the way. We looked at pre-emergence and post-emergence. I'm not going to go into the full details. I haven't got time. But suffice it to say, we, so here we, we've got drilling here. So we've got the pre-emergence. We've got various different ones that we tried pre. And then we tried a whole range of what uh, was available post. And then we looked at establishment, amount of weediness, et cetera, et cetera. In summary, post-emergence, not that great. Pre-emergence definitely had an effect. Uh, so I would say prepare a good stale seed bed, so minimise the amount of weed burden uh, prior to planting, but follow that up with, a, with an additional uh, pre-emergence, unless you're an organic farmer, of course. <laughs> uh, that gave us quite a lot of uh, positive impact for enabling that establishment. Companion trial. This is the other one, so if you're, if you're an organic farmer or you don't want to use chemicals for whatever reason, um, I said that the, uh, the key ones that have been used for many, many years are, are timothy and possibly spring barley and festuca, but we thought, let's have a look at some of the others that might be considered to be possible. So, a bit of a wacky one, chicory. The reason I chose this one was that uh, it is anti-parasite, um, in its own right. It's a nice forage. It's, it's got some benefits itself. A lot of people said, well, it's going to get a little bit competitive. But uh, we thought, well, we'll give it a try. The reason that it, it prevents uh, worm infestation is not so much the biochemistry, but it's actually the furriness of the stem. The larvae, when they're working their way up into the canopy, ready for the animal to then reinfect themselves, they can't do it. So it's, it's like a physical barrier twined with the uh, chemical barrier. Uh, we also looked at oats, we looked at lotus uh, corniculatus, uh, bird's foot trefoil, timothy, obviously, uh, various different varieties. We had a, um, timothy at different rates. We looked at oat 
and we looked at field bean. And in summary, and I've got them at the bottom there, chicory and beans were very positive at early establishment. Uh, and so was oat uh, companions during slightly later establishment. Uh, we found that chicory growing with sanfoin gave you better yields of both of them together and the protein content. Uh, however, if you're looking at a common, which has got that longevity, as I said, it's a bit smaller, it's a bit thinner, we started to get serious um, problems longer term that it was getting a little bit over competitive. So we only looked at it at sort of a, a reasonably high rate of inclusion and a medium rate. And I would go back now if I had some more money and time. We always want <coughs> to do it again, don't we? And look at a very low inclusion rate with a little bit of Timothy as a sort of a three-way mixture. Okay, <coughs>